let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. The Duke Legacy by D.W. Duke, based on a true story, examines the lives of Washington Duke and his descendants, who together built a multi-billion dollar empire and established Duke University. D.W. Duke is an experienced trial attorney, writer, noted lecturer. He's authored five published books, including the popular books, Not Without a Fight, a story of the Polish resistance that we talked about on This Week in America, and now The Duke Legacy. He's also written dozens of articles on various legal topics, ranging from real estate law to human rights, and is a freelance editor for Oxford University Press. D.W. received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Michigan and his Juris Doctorate from Washington University School of Law. Back with us on This Week in America, D.W. Duke, author of The Duke Legacy. D.W., welcome back. A pleasure to have you back with us on the program. Thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, This is such a fascinating book and a story that needs to be told and reading the reviews. They just love what you've done with the, with the legacy of the Duke family and what a remarkable story it is. Let's start with the the very beginning of this process. What fascinated you so much about the, uh, this family that you decided to write this book, the Duke legacy? Well, I was, when I was growing up, my, my grandmother, uh, who actually was from, from Tennessee, the family had come over from North Carolina, she began telling me stories about the, about the Duke family and, and about a, a person in, in North Carolina named Washington Duke, uh, who was my ancestor's nephew. And she had a lot of stories that, that she had passed down, had been passed down to her from the family uh, from the 1800s. And uh, as she began to tell these stories, I listened to them, but it wasn't something that was very interesting to most of the family members, but I was fascinated by it because I had, I had learned what had happened and how he had built a, a financial empire and they established Duke University and so on. So I began looking at it and then I, I began researching and, and over about 20 years, I, I conducted research and uh, consisting both of genealogical research and historical research and then uh, many years later, there was a friend of mine who was a judge who graduated from Duke University, and he and I used to talk a lot on, on cases that I had, and he would often ask me if I was ever going to write the book that I had told him about. So finally I did, and we, <laughs> we came up with it, and there we are. <laughs> we are there today. And the finished product <laughs> is The Duke Legacy. D.W. Duke back with us on the program. The author, his website is thedukelegacy.com, book available at pageturner.us in the bookstore, Amazon, and link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Let's start with this fascinating character, uh, Washington Duke. Uh, talk a little bit about his background, and he really started ground floor, didn't he, and worked his way up to uh, a multi-billion dollar empire. He did. He was born in uh, 1820 in North Carolina, and uh, his father was actually the uh, deputy sheriff and um, was uh, was an offer, officer in the uh, North Carolina militia. And he had, uh, had very uh, strong influence in education, always believed strongly in education, and all of the children, uh, Washington had 10 siblings, and they were all taught to read and write. Uh, he grew up in, in uh, North Carolina. He befriended a young uh, slave boy out from a neighboring plantation and uh, became very good friends over the, over the years. And uh, eventually, uh, Washington was able to help him escape through the Underground Railroad. Now, uh, in North Carolina at that time, the Piedmont District was was largely anti-slavery, but the, there were a lot of slaves, and, and they were sold even at the courthouse, in front of the courthouse. But Washington was always troubled by this this whole scenario. So during his life, he managed to uh, assist a number of slaves uh, obtain their freedom, and he also allowed them to work on his farm as um, a freeman. In other words, they were paid wages; they were not yes. slaves. And uh, so that is how he got involved in that aspect of, um, of the uh, slave uh, entanglement in, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, then as, as uh, he was conscripted into the, um, to the army, the Confederate Army during the Civil War, and of course when you're conscripted, that means you have no choice, you have to go. So uh, he went in and fought and eventually wound up uh, a prisoner 
in one of the prisons, one of the Union prisons. And at the end of the war, he was released and he walked back home and his farm was still there. He had a 300-acre farm. His farm was still there. His wife was deceased. His four children were still living. And a young uh, young girl that he had uh, freed as a slave uh, in 1855 was still there. And so he began, he took a wagon load of tobacco that they had, uh, had, they had on the farm, and he began um, distributing it and offering it at a really low price so people could try it because it was different. It was, uh, they called it bright leaf. It was a lighter tobacco. And at that time, uh, people believed that tobacco had medicinal value. Uh, they thought it was good for respiratory illnesses and all, all kinds of things that, of course, later on we learned wasn't true. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, <laughs> He believed that he was doing something to really help society. He even called the company Pro Bono Publico uh, for the public benefit because he thought he was offering a medicinal product. Um, so he, the the uh, tobacco company grew uh, very big. Um, eventually, uh, as he got older, he, he retired and his sons took it over. And they're the ones who, who developed the American Tobacco Company, which turned it into a, a huge uh, empire. And uh, at that point, um, the uh, U.S. government uh, actually sued them under the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, saying that the company was too large. So they broke it up. But the, the net result of all of that is the, the family then learned about the, the harm from tobacco, and they divested all of their holdings and invested in the hydroelectric power and textiles. So that is the, the direction it went, which is today why you have Duke Energy and Duke Power. Um, Duke University was, was um, originally called Trinity College, and it was uh, a Methodist university. Uh, before that, I mean, long, long before that, it was called Union School and, and some other names, but the, the Methodists had taken it over and called it uh, Trinity College. And then after Washington, Duke died, uh, James Buchanan Duke left a, a substantial amount of money to the university, and, and the name was eventually changed to Duke University from Trinity College. And of course, the rest is history, especially for basketball fans. <laughs> oh yes, yes. So thank, thankfully, he did that. This is wonderful. And Duke, uh, I love the logo. It fits on the T-shirt. This was perfect naming for the university, and what a basketball legacy they have there. Let's go back a little bit and talk about as the is he's laying the foundation for the Duke Empire. And I love how you mentioned there's so many businesses that has Duke in the beginning, and they're all. Many of them, at least, related to this Duke, Washington Duke, and, and what he started. But he did have challenges along the way. Talk about some of the challenges. This wasn't necessarily a, a smooth ride as he was establishing this empire. Well, that that's true. Um, they had a number of challenges with uh, with the with the mentality and the idea of people with today. One of his biggest problems, of course, was with the with the slave issue. Uh, he was very troubled by the institution of slavery and was always always trying to do something to um, help the people who were slaves. And then after after the war was over, uh, then he began giving substantial amounts of money to uh, people who wanted to establish uh, black businessmen who wanted to establish businesses. There was a famous insurance company and, and other companies that he had um, uh, helped uh, helped in this way. So he, he faced a lot of these challenges, but a lot of them had to do with the a culture at the time, and of course, um, it, it was so, slavery was so prevalent that people who were slow, opposed to slavery had to uh, had to do it in a very uh, very calculated um, and very deliberate way. Uh, if they just went out and started protesting slavery, that was one way to do it. But sometimes they would do it in other ways by just helping people on the you know one on one to the best that they could, and that was more the way he operated. But yes, he had challenges. They had uh, situations where uh, people tried to take the business from them, and uh, you know, typical challenges as a as a business is getting larger. Uh, as people try to move in, and and those kinds of things occur. Talk about your challenges as a writer. Let's start with the research, and then we'll talk about the fact that you took something that that could be you you would either have to sort of overhype it or make it like a textbook, and it's not. It reads like a real story, and it's difficult once you start reading it to to stop reading it. You're fascinated with Washington Duke and uh, and uh, his descendants. Talk about the research. How long did it take you? How extensive was the research for this book? Well, it was about probably 30 years. I think I began researching it with my father back in the um, uh, early 90s, um, even a little bit in college, back 
even before that, and I'll tell you, you'll know how old I am when I say it was back in the 70s. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Oh, I remember the 70s <laughs> well, in college as well. Yeah. So, But back then, researching genealogy, uh, that was one thing we were always looking at because we wanted to find all of the angles and everything. It was a lot different than it is today because we didn't have the Internet. So, for example, if a person wanted to research um, – uh, you know, John Doe in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, you basically had to travel there yes. and, and go through all the records yourself unless someone else had done it and, and you could write to that person and get the information you needed. But there was very little research. And even up until um, the Internet first became, um, you know, widely, widely used, uh, it was very difficult to do genealogy research. Now, today, it, it's very easy. So a person can, if the information exists, you can usually find it on the Internet. Somebody's going to post it. There's a lot of inaccurate information out there. Uh, DNA helped a lot, but a lot of people um, need to understand that DNA is not the answer to everything either because it doesn't take into consideration uh, half-siblings, infidelity, uh, adoptions. And often back in, in the 1700s, 1800s, if a person was – was a child and they were taken in by a family, there was no formal adoption. They just took them in and raised them. And they just took on that family's name. So you had a lot of those things happen too. So, you know, genealogy research was very difficult. One thing that really surprised us was uh, we, we discovered that infidelity was much more common back in the 1800s than we, than I ever expected. Uh, and the way we found that out was our, our DNA research kind of revealed that. But again, you have to be careful because a lot of other, other features can enter into it. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier. So those yes. are the difficulties in that type of research. As far as the as far as the uh, research of Washington himself, that was fairly easy once he was once he was an adult because uh, he didn't say much about his experience during the Civil War. But after he became wealthy, then you know, there's, there's documents everywhere about him, public records and books and a lot of things written about him. So the most difficult part was, was while he was younger, and that was just based primarily on, on family stories that had been passed down. Uh, but uh, as he got older, a lot of the information is contained in the David Rubenstein um, section of the library at Duke University. So the information is available um, if a person wants to research it. A lot of information about the family is available today. So as a combination, the book reads like in some ways like a textbook, but I, I strongly believe that historical uh, biographical novels and, and uh, historical fiction is, is really one of the best ways to reach the young people today because, you know, a lot of, to an extent, they're not being taught much in the way of history in, in schools anymore. Yes. And, and the other thing is they enjoy it. They, they like to read a story about a person and read it in a storyline format. So what I try to do when I write these books is uh, if it's based on a true story like this one, that means that it is very, very close to the accurate information as I can find. I tried to keep it as, as close as I could, and sometimes you can't find out certain details, and you just give your best estimate of what occurred. Uh, if something is uh, uh, if something is inspired by uh, a particular person, like another book I recently wrote, uh, a lot of times the, the, you don't have as much information. You have to you have to create a little more than than you would in a in a case like Washington Duke and the Duke family. You've got footnotes, which are helpful as well, and also shows us the level of research that you put into writing this book, The Duke Legacy, by D.W. Duke, our guest on the program. His website is thedukelegacy.com. Book available, pageturner.us, Amazon, all of the usual places. One review saying that D.W. has raised the historical fiction to a higher standard. And I think, uh, what was your reaction when you read that? That had to be like the utmost compliment that, I, you know, that's very, very flattering. I don't remember that particular review, <laughs> but I have had people tell me that. that <laughs> well, I'll circle it red and send it to you so you've got that. I thought, okay, that really says something about what you've done. Time is going by way too quickly. I would like to talk about Washington's granddaughter, Doris, died under suspicious circumstances. Talk about that because this is a case that you hear frequently in, in the news when we're talking about elder abuse. That's correct. It was, it was a tragic situation. Uh, Doris, and, and a number of reasons I believe this happened, she has essentially uh, become isolated from the family. She didn't have much contact with the family as, as she aged. And she died in Beverly Hills. And um, what we discovered after the fact, in fact, there was a, there was a movie um, made about, about it um, several years ago called Too Rich, I think it was. And yes. It was it aired on television. And 
Um, I, I took a different approach. I got into the actual legal aspect of it. I, I got deposition transcripts. Uh, we, we have transcript records of, of uh, the doctor who was caring for her. Uh, all that information is contained in the book. I worked with the with her personal attorneys, Don Howarth and Suzel Smith, uh, to get as much information as I could, and they were one of the best sources of information about her. Uh, they knew her very well. And so we, I was able to compile a lot of information about her life. And, and essentially, um, by, by the definition um, that uh, we would use today and even at the time, she was murdered. Uh, she was overdosed on morphine. And uh, it was an effort to take her estate. And, and in the book, I talk about some of the names of celebrities that were involved in this. Uh, we don't know to the extent they were actually involved in the effort to uh, terminate her to take her her estate, but we know that certain individuals were for sure, including her butler, uh, who who was named the executor of her estate. But uh, that was during the time that she was not um, not cognitively there. So uh, a lot of abuse went on because she was alone. And the one thing that we took away from that is is it's so important to keep those family relations together the best you can, uh, because without that, a lot of times you have no one to protect you, and that's how she wound up. I understand you've uh, and other attorneys given lectures in in college law schools using the uh, this case as the uh, as a case study. Yes, yes, we gave uh, we gave a lecture at Pepperdine Law School. Uh, other groups too. We've talked before the California Association of Realtors. Uh, we did quite a bit of that. I did that again with with her personal attorneys. We uh, gave quite a few of those, and it was very well received. People found it fascinating um, because the, we we really go through the details of of the case. So the Duke legacy continues in, in that aspect as well as so many others. We talked about the, the multi-billion dollar empire, the academic institution, a charitable foundation as well. And that goes back to what we were talking about, the compassion that uh, Washington Duke and his family had. That's been a very important of the, a part of the legacy, hasn't it? It is. I think, I think Washington Duke, his whole life was about compassion. Um, that's the way he viewed the world. He wasn't a person that uh, would be angry about things. He didn't hold anger toward people. He tried to find a uh, resolution to issues. And, and again, slavery was his, was his, uh, uh, his pet peeve. I, I recall uh, his son, Benjamin, used to say that even when I was just a tiny little boy, um, my, my father called slavery an evil abomination, and he was opposed to it long before the Civil War. But yes, he was always a person of compassion, felt that people should be treated fairly, regardless of race, ethnicity, wealth, anything, that shouldn't matter. What's this been like for you to tell the story? Just in, in reading it and listening to you and uh, the enthusiasm you have for sharing the story with others, what's it been like for you to tell the story? I've enjoyed it. I, I've, I've enjoyed talking about Washington uh, because he was such an inspirational man. Uh, I, I think that we need we need more. We need to see more of that, and especially today, when when so often, so many people want to disparage everybody who existed before the year 1900, for example. Uh, they they simply they want to disparage them because of the belief system that existed in those days. And and the good thing for me was that he was not a conformist in that way. He did not go along with a lot of what was happening, and and he resisted it in the most logical and the best way he could, in a way that he knew how. Um, so I, I think I, I enjoy it because I, I really like to see someone do the kinds of things that Washington did. What surprised you as you were writing this book? I'm sure you went in and you had uh, you know uh, 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 some knowledge of the family. Uh, what surprised you? Were there surprises as you were going through and doing the research, things that uh, uh, maybe impressed you very much that uh, the family was involved with? Well, I think part of it was um, when I began to find um, public um, uh, verification and authentication of, of information that I'd received from my grandmother. Uh, when I was a child, I just received information verbally, and of course it was just what she told me. Um, so then I started doing research, and, and I found uh, that the stories were actually true. Um, I, I think in terms of, of events that occurred, uh, probably one of the things that surprised me the most, again, was the way Doris uh, passed and, and what she went through yes. uh, before her death. That was probably the most surprising, that you would see that happen in a family with this kind of wealth. It, it's really mind-boggling to even believe that that could occur. Um, but it, it, it can, and, and it did in her case. 
Um, I, I think I was also surprised a little bit with um, um, just the way that that Wash. Well, here's one story. Washington, um, his daughter died, and uh, he wanted. He had thought to himself, you know what? She could not have attended Trinity College uh, because she's female. And so he decided that he was going to try to do something about that. So he gave Trinity College three hundred thousand dollar donation, which of course back then was huge. That was huge, huge yes. Yeah, and, and so and so what he did, he said, "I'll give you two hundred thousand, but if you want the last one hundred thousand, you have to admit women on the same standard as men." So the university quickly <laughs> did that. They they accepted that right away. Yes. So that that surprised me that he did that. Um, and then later he said, I shouldn't have done that. I should not have interfered in the university's operation. But between you and me, I think he did the right thing. He did the right <laughs> thing. And a couple of minutes left here. Let's talk about lessons. You talk about, yeah, at a certain age, we really don't pay much attention to what these people accomplished. If you were teaching at Duke University a class on the Duke legacy, I would think there'd be a lot of lessons that you could, you could teach. Talk a little bit about that. Wow. What, there are many lessons, aren't there? There are, there are. I think the, the primary lesson that I would teach, and it's a lesson that I, I teach all the time, is that uh, our world today lacks empathy and compassion. Yes. And, and that is the biggest problem. That is the root cause of all the problems that we have in the world, the lack of empathy and compassion. And so recently, um, I, I was asked, asked to write a book for another publisher um, uh, called Racism Awareness, where, where we talk about racial issues and discrimination. And then we give stories of, of people who actually uh, went through things so that, that the reader can see what others have experienced and how, how painful it was for them. So each chapter of the book begins with a, with a short story about somebody's experience like that. And the idea is to just teach empathy and compassion, because to a considerable extent, uh, it, it's learned. It, it, it's a learned um, um, emotion. Yes. You learn to care about other people. Now, to a degree, it exists when a person is born, and psychologists have a different interpretation on the way babies will, for example, if a baby's mother's crying, a baby will start crying. And, and a lot of psychologists say, well, that's the child is empathizing with the mother. And, and that may be what's happening there. But as a person gets older, they, I think they become a little more selfish and they forget about the importance of empathy and compassion. And so what I would always try to teach people is, is empathy and compassion. For example, I'm a lawyer. In, in cases I have, I always try to get clients to find a way to resolve the case as opposed to going to trial. Sometimes you have no choice, but uh, you know the goal is to try to uh, find a peaceful solution to situations that exist in the world. That's what I would be teaching if I were teaching in a university. Well, there's so many lessons. You pick up the book, The Duke Legacy. You'll be fascinated by Washington Duke and the family and what they were able to do and how they put their personal beliefs ahead of uh, profits in some cases. You talk about tobacco and the shift there, slavery and the shift there. It's just a, a fascinating read, a, uh, uh, a spotlight on a family that we don't hear a whole lot about, especially outside of the, the southern part of the country. The book is The Duke Legacy, D.W. Duke. The author is uh, back with us on This Week in America. He was here when we talked about his book, Not Without a Fight, A Story of the Polish Resistance, another excellent book. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. You've got, it sounds like, other books coming up and would love to have you back to talk about those as well. I would enjoy that, and I enjoy being on your show, Rick. You always have a great show. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation. Our guest, D.W. Duke. The book is The Duke Legacy. Very simple. His website is thedukelegacy.com. Book available at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the usual places, pageturner.us. We thank them for arranging our conversation today. D.W. Duke is the name of the author of the book, The Duke Legacy. All this information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we are back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again, thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.